Life can be a breeze. Some years seem to take forever at the time, only to pass in the blink of an eye upon recollection. For one Yannick Emerald, the sixteen-year-old son of the Herzog, or the Duke of Emerald Vale, however, this is about to be a break in that cycle. A singular moment that brings into sharp relief who our second son is to become. Everything that has gone before, and everything yet to come. One day, as our story begins, he splashes back first into a pond in full chainmail. As the water fills his lungs in the middle, holds him down, he receives an apparition beneath the water, a vision of his own death. He sees himself old, married, with an emerald sword falling from his hands, and his body riddled with crossbow bolts on his throne. He emerges from the water transformed by the certainty of the moment of his death. But who is this boy, and what does fate have in store for him? What destiny does he have to achieve? Let's pull back for a second. I'm Lee, co-founder of this channel and all our creative endeavors under the label of Diesel Shot. Judge Wolf is the strapping lad we see here depicting a 16-year-old. Don't worry, he'll be growing up fast. We will be joined by Matt of Improv and RPG. Go check out his channel. And Greg of Diesel Shot fame. They represent the rakish bard Lee Wei, stuck in a station well below his aspirations, beneath the very walls of this keep where Yannick has had his brush with death, and Fazzle, the master of the hunt, presently summoned it to his liege's side about a wearing string of animal attacks, respectively. These three strands tied together to form the first episode of Reign of Roses, Book Zero, Days of Thy Father. Talk about a mouthful. Book Zero is the prequel to a campaign where the premise is we begin play at the instant of the first player's birth, and their father has already adventured, loved, lost, warred, and reigned through his own campaign. I have got just seven episodes to deliver this entire cinematic experience that will serve as the underpinning for the rest of the dozen or so books or seasons Reign of Roses is going to turn into. This campaign, like all diamonds, shall be cooked under pressure. The leecap is going to give you a summary of events up front and ruminations in the back. I'll clearly delineate the difference for those of specific interest. With all that out of the way, we resume. Yannick has a chat with his grandfather before hopping in that pond. Dalricker is a wandering old man of peculiar interests and eccentricities. Yannick spends a great deal of time with him talking and playing games. Today, however, he finds his younger grandchild examining a strange stone. Red dots marking a blue ring of 20 points, a straight line from point to point. Normally it's not visible behind the reeds and flowers of the gardens, but they've recently been wicked away to save the garden from a blight that has been tracked in. Yannick's grandfather informs him they're called circle stones, Mention he hears there's 22 of them all around the castle. This all seems important, but he's being called, as it all happens, by his brother Daichi. He's not just in the chainmail for show, you see. His elder brother of two years, already successful on his orderly quest and considered a man in deed and truth, is egging him on to come fight. You see, Daichi has the bright idea to teach his brother about bridge fighting. On the bridges over their castle garden, pawned by a family shrine, no less. Yannick is tired of his older brother's antics and always lording his ritter status over him, so he decides to go out there and show him what for. He takes him with a strong feint and knocks him what for. However, despite the fact that Yannick is clearly to be a battle master one day, showing us his prowess here, his brother does successfully respond with a pommel bash, takes him off his guard, and leaves him plunging into the pool. Just like that, one failed save and he's in the drink. Now Yannick has his vision... The men-at-arms and Daichi fish him out of the pond, and just as Yannick says no one needs to know, they are summoned at once to the Lord's Hall, because as it turns out, that already does. One long walk later, they get dressed down by their father. Sigrun is a severe man, but he's mostly punishing Daichi, despite Yannick trying to take the fall for this fall. His father's not having it. One of his lords, Lady Renho Masaoki, is uh, here to make a few cracks, but her main input is that the great virtue of a strategist is knowing to choose when to strike. A fact that will come up later in this story. His father's got more important things in the mind, however. There's a perfect quest brewing, and he aims to send Yannick out on it. This is where Fazel comes in. He was already in the throne room to discuss the letter, and he had received uh, this call for aid. There have been brutal disappearances late at night, but rain is covering the tracks of the beasts that's striking. The current ruler of Steinbridge is a 13-year-old girl, and they lack another liege to beseech. 
for though she is but the daughter of a humble country ritter who fell in battle, she enjoys immediacy to the duke's throne. That is to say, they have no barons or lords that they're sworn to between them and the Herzog. We got mention of the fact this immediacy stems from a battle, where the old von Steinbridge died valiantly, leading a charge his compatriots were a wee bit too chicken shit to initially uh, make, that cut off an enemy's attempt to flee. The Anik takes all this in stride, plays off the fact that he's obviously just taking a dip in the pond as washing his armor, and accepts the fact he's saddled with this job but also gets informed that this is to be his really quest. They've even brought out the traditional double-handled stein of Ritter making. They cannot return, no matter what, until this quest is complete. That's how it works. This sets the stage for the next scene as we swipe over to Li Wei. But before we do, Fazil establishes himself with his quirky voice and mount, which is a dinosaur with feathers, and Mom comes out to give her son some javelins and tell him to come home with the forehead kissy. The castle we were just in, Three Hill, towers above the city it is in the heart of. But its third hill is away from the other two, so a bridge connects them on high. Below that bridge is Canal Street, the heart of Underbridge, where the poorest denizens of Old Town have gathered. Li Wei has slept in, as per usual, while his parents are out making ends meet. We see him interact with some locals, and he gets word of three strangers in town. Scords, men of the north, clothed in furs and leather who are rarely seen in this part of town. Scords are known mostly as merchants these days, but older folks recall their days as Viking raiders. That largely ended on a fateful day ten years ago, but knowledge of this is limited among the youth of Underbridge. Li Wei's partner in crime, Wa, does mention his family used to be farmers before the Vikings destroyed his village, though. More importantly than any geopolitical strife to them, though, is the knowledge that these Scordian strangers have stacked boxes in an alleyway. They're hovering around one of the grand cleats of the bridge above, uh, covering in its shadow and keeping an eye out while blocking the only path out of the street with those boxes. Li Wei smells money, but gets wise to the fact that those boxes are stacked pretty poorly and filled with what looks to be just heavy rocks. He calls off his companion with a nat one absolutely nasty flute note that spooks everyone. As all this happens, Yannick and Fazl are making their way down through Underbridge and crossing the nearby Canal Bridge. They're about to be at the site of the obvious ambush spot, and Liwei notices a lurking score on the roof. It's all too obvious what is about to happen, and Yannick gets sus when he sees a stranger stare right at him around a corner after a loud altercation as Liwei attempted to distract the would-be ambusher. Liwei cries out, the scored woman nearest them tries to slash Fazl's throat, and the battle is met. This is the campaign's first combat. We've established that Yannick, at the very least, and very probably Liwei as well, has never killed anybody. Now they're thrust into a life or death scenario with Fazl to guard them. The two scores are skirmishers, able to bonus action disengage and spend all their movement to make a powerful bow shot. They don't wind up doing as much ranged combat as they were designed to, but they're also not operating under their ideal conditions. The third scored up on the roof, however, is a shaman. He calls upon ice and the spirits of winter to buff his allies and blast his foes which he starts his part of the combat by doing, cannonballing between Fazl and Yannick, then unleashing his ability to blow ice all over as it throws out a wave of frost that everyone, mounts included, must save against. Fazl alone uh, is worse for wear on that chest, but everyone takes a bit of damage. The violence escalates frenetically. The shaman imbued an ally's spear with frost, but Li Wei successfully wrested that spear away from him and wound up stabbing the man in the back and killing him with the very enchanted energy he was intended to wield against that mark. Yannick narrowly avoided his first human kill initially when a surge of blows left the shaman barely standing, and his trusty steed Artax slammed the man's skull into the stone base of the bridge, splattering it like an overripe pink melon. Yannick did score his first kill in the end, though, as the last woman standing took aim for and missed his head time and time again as Fazl harried her, until Yannick rode up and drove his blade deep into her heart. As she died and reached out to grasp at his throat, she finally succumbed and fully gave out, sliding off the implement of her demise. Some hasty introductions and recognitions later, Li Wei is scooped onto Artax's back with Janik and the three ride out of town ASAP. Remember, this is really a quest. No going back. Out on the road, Li Wei wonders at the world beyond city walls. 
Yannick vomits and reflects on the fact that they've just killed men. And Faz reveals he may have killed a whole lot more than beasts in his day. His primary advice on the morality of killing? Go for a liquid breakfast. After quite a few laughs, he does go on to articulate the idea that beasts do not choose to kill. They simply obey their nature. Meanwhile, their assassins did choose, thus lessening the burden of killing them. Yannick introduces an interesting idea. What if his would-be assassins felt that they must kill him? That they had no more choice than the eagle or the wolf? Felt no more pressing in need than he did to defend himself? These matters of philosophy don't get resolved on this ride. The group travels overland a time to reach a post town, which is well defended and trafficked. These are special sediments that go back to the days of the Kehoe, though most are in disarray or faded from prominence by now. Built entirely along a highway in densely wall-to-wall -wall packed rows, they offer services and security for travelers, especially merchants, and act as a hub for taxation on said traffic. Think of it as a ye olde pilot's gas station. Once Yannick announces himself, he's quickly shown to the local ruler, one Baron O'Bron. They meet him and his retainers, and he plies Yannick with stories about how great he's doing, but also his concerns about neighboring Steinbridge and how the bridge lies undefended from risks such as bandits. They spend the night, Leeway astonished at the quality of living and Yannick finding himself in a cramped equivalent of the familiar, while Fazel changes out his wooden utensils for silverware, the take-a-spoon-leave-a-spoon tray, as drawers are sometimes also known. The next day they leave for Steinbridge. At the bridge, quite nearby, they find two of the Ritters and Obron's employees stacking the bridge. Iki, known as Iki the Ojimbo, is an older gentleman who is very polite to the trio, but he is accompanied by his younger, less interested in guard duty companion, Kurai. They're both Ritters who wandered in as Ronan and got offered sweet deals from Obron, houses in town and a salaried position as his retainers. After Yannick diffuses a tense conversation they ride on, it's time to call upon the young Von Steinbridge and get to the bottom of this. The Manor Von Steinbridge, a steepled longhouse with the two one-story boxes to either side for servants' living quarters and a kitchen respectively. The Manor of Von Steinbridge is no castle, just a wooden thatch abode of a humble country ritter. The floor is packed dirt with spread rushes, and the only second floor space utilized as such is a landing above the throne that houses the ruler's bedroom and looks out over the fire pit the main hall. When they first arrive, though, the door is shut and they need to call out and investigate. They quickly discover the 13-year-old Gleesa von Steinbridge is cowering in her abode and very afraid. There was another attack last night. One of her servants and her steward were abducted, and there were signs of blood and violence where it happened. She tells of hiding from a creature that needed neither light nor vision to see, and Vasil finds evidence of carapace, but no fur. This is definitely no bear attack, and what's more, the victims have been dragged off. Fazel is able to determine the creature is probably a vizier from the deep below region known as the Devuvion. They are a paralytic ga they have a paralytic gaze and the ability to refine halite into sticky saline solution and capacitates their meals, sticking them together to save for later. The situation is dire, but Glisa only talks after Liwei manages to calm her down. Yannick is a man of his people, but also a straightforward and, at times, gruff one. The situation becomes rapidly clear. They need to find the cave this creature is in, stat, if they're to have any hope of saving the steward. They ride for a place called Wolf Run Cave, which used to be a ha house for nearby wolf packs, until shortly after an earthquake a few months back. On the way, they encounter a wee puppy pug, who Yannick swiftly names Samantha and plops in his saddlebags. That's right, everyone. It's puppy time. The trio enter the cave. Yannick and Leeway's human eyes need torchlight to see, so Leeway lights one after Fazel confirms there's not immediate danger around the corner. It's a goblin who's got a clean 60 feet of dark vision. They proceed through the burbling river that runs into the cave, and Yannick recalls a story told by his mother involving a beast of the underworld, overcome by traveling through a stream, so it could not unseenly sense him. So he hops in that ice cold cave stream and wades around knee deep. Yannick and water, I guess. Leeway behind the torch on high and Fazl out ahead, scouting with his goblin eyes. The trio comes upon the lair of the Vazir slowly and shittily. They score two 11s and a 12 on their stealth rolls. 
Even if they didn't, and the Vizier's passive perception wasn't 12, the darkness simply wouldn't hide them. The tremor sense of the foe was not getting overcome simply by walking slowly in the dark. It doesn't matter how well you roll in stealth, if you come right out in front of somebody with nothing to cover you, you're seen. Fazl just about glances a dead mastiff, the presumptive mother, uh, late mother of our wee Samantha, and the servant and steward who are still alive but stuck in the sailing goop before the razor's the vizier swoops down on them. They catch each other on the approach and pop a shot, each of them. Fazl, dinking at the shell with his boomerang, and the vizier slicing the goblin huntmaster deep with the stonecutter claws. The fight that ensues is brutal. Two of the three javelins get rammed into the foe's hide. Li Wei utilizes bardic magic by way of his flute to aid his friends and physically mock his crabby foe. Yannick wets his blade as blue-white blood gushes from his foe after he stares it down and overcomes his paralytic gaze. And Fazl deploys some of his hunting skills, showing off his ranger abilities. It ends with the beast slain and the civilians rescued. That was where we cut it for the night. That's it for the recap, folks. But this is the Lee cap, so here's a quick Lee flexion. I didn't have the garden fully ready, and I didn't test the foundry modules extensively enough to know how the viewers would wind up seeing multi-level maps. People spent part of the night staring at uh, roofs that were awkwardly above the players. All of the players could see everything fine. There were awkward, awkward gaps without backtracking, as in back tracks of music due to me not properly categorizing files when I had the time. Meaning I lacked two hand music for some segments despite literally commissioning two tracks to having a third made by Mouth Cole for this campaign. Technicals aside, I wound up cutting some scenes for time. I wanted to spend more time lingering with Li Wei and his street companions, possibly giving him ways to totally defuse the ambush as we established that scene more. And I wanted to play up Daichi and Yannick's relationship longer. Later in the episode, they were supposed to emerge victorious with the political dilemma, as O'Bron was trying to press his claim to the bridge, and therefore its taxes, by virtue of being the one defending it, with his aforementioned Rithers. That I wound up resolving off-screen with Judge Wolf in DMs, and will probably get lip service the next episode start. I hit an absolute goals mark, but relearned lessons about preparedness and foundry, unfortunately. Bringing an asset to bear is a few steps more complicated than just having it, a great weakness of the otherwise more robust foundry over its simpler web competitor I used for seven years running and still like to keep my home games and change star sessions on roll 20. I wanted to show the Lords Watano and Half Teeth conspiring off in a side hall, for example, and I had their tokens minted and named and in the right spot, but building actors and pointing their image file at the right spot is a much longer process than just clicking and dragging them right onto the screen like roll 20 offers. I wound up passing on being super specific with that piece of foreshadowing but I'll have plenty of other opportunities. I wanted to have Yannick grow up fast, but putting an encounter against human foes before the Vizier in retrospect feels a little messy. He's now already killed another human being, and that removes a lot of the potential escalation we're going to see later in the game. That being said, establishing the cycle of recriminations, alluding to what Seagrin did to the Scords, showing the Zilfug clan seeking revenge, and making Yannick a blooded part of that cycle, largely against his will. Yet that was all a key part of hooking the players and the audience on the themes of what's to come and the mediations this campaign will have to offer on the nature of the conflict. In retrospect, there's some behind-the-scenes explanations for why there were only three assassins there. Uh, let's just say the Ritterly quest was announced pretty suddenly, but people knew that that was going to be an opportunity. It makes perfect sense that they could have been lying in wait on his return. And... If I hadn't built up the Vazir in my head as a climax and built the map for it and done all the art and such for it first, I do think there's room for me to reassemble that same set of information in perhaps a stronger format. Well, it's not as done now. I enjoyed the banter between our three heroes, and I'm excited to see how they deal with that. Uh, the future is... Uh, in for a shakeup as 17 year old Yannick, freshly a Ritter and making a name for himself, gets thrust into new and exciting situations. Overall, I had a great time and I hope this has been helpful to you as someone interested in Reign of Roses. We're looking at more peaks at the realm management to come late campaign or next episode, The Noble's Lot. So, until next time, dreamers. <laughs>